Hey everyone, Nigel here. Just wanted to give you a heads up before we begin that today's story is technically a re-release. Unfortunately, I've been sick the past couple of days, so it's kind of messed up our schedule and I haven't had time to research and write a new long-form case. That being said, we didn't want to leave you with nothing, so we decided to dig back into our archives to bring you something from the earlier days of the channel. Chances are it'll still be new to the vast majority of you, and we think it's a pretty interesting case. We hope you think so as well, but if it's not your thing, no worries. We should be back to our regular schedule next week. Alright, let's get into it. On the morning of August 11th, 1994, Captain Mark Peterson and crew set out on his fishing trawler, the Lady Marion, in New South Wales, Australia. The workday began like any other, with the men cruising up to the mouth of the Hawkesbury River, just a few kilometers north of Sydney, casting their nets along the way. The area was and is a popular area for commercial fishing, and on that particular day Mark and his crew were in good spirits. The waters were calm, and they were hoping to land a sizable catch of shrimp or squid. After stopping for some time at a quiet spot just past Challenger Head, it seemed that the crew of the Lady Marion were in luck, when shortly before noon they noticed the unmistakable feeling of a heavy tug on their nets. Believing that this could be the generous haul of seafood that he and the others were searching for, Mark decided to drag the nets back up onto the deck of the ship to see what they had caught. However, as the men struggled to lift the morning's catch back to the surface, it wasn't long before their hopes were dashed, when they realized that the heavy weight within their nets wasn't from shrimp, squid, or anything else that they had been trying to catch that day. Instead, it was from a large, rusting sort of steel rack that seemed to have several plastic bags attached to it. Before the men could even come to grips with their disappointment, though, another discovery would signal that this was no ordinary pile of dumped garbage or wreckage when Mark noticed what appeared to be a bone sticking out of one of the plastic bags. Despite his initial belief that the bone might belong to an animal, a closer inspection would soon reveal the unsettling truth. This bone looked human, and it was far from the only one that had been attached to the metal rack. Though they didn't know it yet, what Mark and his crew had uncovered were the mostly skeletal remains of an entire body, one whose identity would elude investigators for more than two decades, and lead to one of Australia's most baffling mysteries. This is the story of Rackman. As Mark Peterson and his crew tried to make sense of the disturbing catch now aboard their ship, they noticed additional alarming details. The steel rack was unlike anything that they had seen before, and the skeleton had been attached as though the device were some sort of metal crucifix. It was at this point that Mark contacted the Broken Bay Water Police. When officers arrived a short time later, they escorted the Lady Marion to nearby Patonga Wharf, located on the north side of the Hawkesbury River. Once there, a preliminary examination of the bones confirmed everyone's worst fears. These were indeed human remains. A day later, Everything was sent to the New South Wales Institute of Forensic Medicine, where a thorough analysis was conducted by pathologist Dr. Chris Lawrence. Like the crew of the Lady Marion, Dr. Lawrence noted almost right away that the bones attached to the steel rack appeared to be roughly anatomically arranged, suggesting that whoever this person was, they had been strapped to the device in one piece before they ended up in the water. More specifically, most of the body appeared to have been wrapped in one long sheet of black plastic, while two additional plastic bags had been used to cover the head. Though we came across conflicting descriptions in our research, the steel rack itself was described by most sources as a 1.82 meter or roughly 6 foot tall piece of flat metal, which had two cylindrical bars welded to it at the top and bottom. Between the two cylinders, in the middle of the long metal piece, there were also two pieces of rebar attached. However, unlike the cylinders, these had been bent into a kind of L shape, as if to prevent the remains from falling off the rack. The body had been further secured to the device through the use of rope and wire, which had been attached at the ankles, knees, torso, and wrists. The neck had been specially secured using what appeared to be some kind of non-slip knot. Though the remains were almost completely skeletal, 
Dr. Lawrence was able to conclude, based on the skull and the few remaining hairs, that they belonged to a dark-haired Caucasian male, who he estimated to be anywhere between 21 and 46 years old. He also determined that the man had been fairly short, measuring about 160 to 163 centimeters, or between 5 foot 2 and 5 foot 4. The height was important because it suggested that the steel rack had been custom made for the man, as the cylindrical bars were an exact match to his wingspan. The chilling discovery was further evidence of the elaborate measures that had been taken to dispose of the man's body. Understandably, details like these left little doubt in anyone's mind that the unknown man had been murdered, with Dr. Lawrence listing the official cause of death as blunt force injuries to the head. However, because of the advanced state of decay in which the remains were found, it was impossible to determine what, if any other injuries the man had sustained before his death, or even if he had been alive or dead at the time that he was attached to the metal rack and thrown into the water. This same issue would also pose a significant problem for investigators when they tried to identify the unknown man. Decomposition had eroded his fingerprints and facial features, and DNA was still a technology very much in its infancy at the time. Though a small sample was recovered from the remains, it was nowhere near the quantity that detectives required to be useful in their search. The clothes and personal items found with the unknown man were similarly nondescript. He wore a medium-sized polo shirt with the label Everything Australian, a pair of dark track pants branded No Sweat, and a pair of Sparrow blue and white striped underwear. The only things in his pockets were a package of Benson and Hedges cigarettes and a pink lighter. While police would eventually track down the manufacturer of the man's polo shirt in their desperation for any leads, all they were able to learn was that the shirt had been mass-produced between 1982 and 1987, and that it could have been purchased at any of the company's 23 stores in New South Wales and Queensland during that time. Perhaps the most significant clues that investigators were able to find about the man came from examinations of his teeth. After analyzing the body, forensic odontologist Dr. Chris Griffiths noted that the man's face might have been slightly misshapen, that he had no fillings, and that his first lower right molar had been removed, probably when he was quite young. While this hardly broke the case wide open, at least the information could be used in future comparisons against known dental records to find or rule out potential matches. Determined to find additional information they could use to help them uncover the man's identity, investigators turned to other experts who they hoped could find more within their limited pool of clues. At the Adelaide Forensic Science Centre in South Australia, forensic biologist Silvana Tritico examined the hair samples from the body, agreeing with investigators' conclusions that the victim was a Caucasian male and adding that he might have been of either Mediterranean or Eastern European descent. A possible timeline of the case was added when investigators took the steel rack over to the University of Sydney, where Professor Donald Anderson was able to conclude that the device had likely been submerged for anywhere between six months and a year. He made this determination based on the growth rate of barnacles that had been attached to the rack when it was removed from the water, although it's worth pointing out that Anderson told police the device could have been submerged for longer. Indeed, early reports about the case we came across quote police as saying that the rack could have been in the water for up to two years. Finally, with the help of a forensic anatomist and forensic anthropologist, investigators had a facial reconstruction made of the unknown man. This 3D bust was used to create further computer-enhanced pictures of the victim, which were publicized in the papers, broadcast news reports, and on the crime television show Australia's Most Wanted. It was hoped that by circulating the image as widely as possible, someone would recognize him. Though the man was known to investigators by the name Unknown Human Remains E48293, as a result of this media blitz, he became known to members of the public simply as Rackman. With the publicity of the Rackman case, came numerous theories about who the unidentified man might be and what might have happened to him. The interest in the case was driven not only by the sensational details of the story itself, but by a reward offered by police for any information leading to the man's identification as well as the arrest of those responsible for his murder. 
The reward would eventually balloon to $100,000, though few credible tips were received. What police got instead was a tidal wave of speculation about everything from gangland killings and missing mobsters to satanic cults who might be operating in the area. Of course, many of these theories were ones that police themselves had already thought of, particularly when it came to the murder having possible mob connections. Indeed, this was one of, if not the first idea considered by investigators, who believed that the elaborate nature of the crime had all the hallmarks of a mafia-style killing. The precise construction of the metal rack suggested a level of chilling professionalism, especially since it appeared to have been specially built for the victim. Given the weight of the rack, it likely would have taken several people to move it, and required the use of a boat to get it to where it was found, both things that would have been well within the capabilities of organized criminals. Despite having far less convincing evidence to back it up, the theory of potential cult involvement in Rackman's murder was also a popular one at the time. Believers of this theory argued that the steel rack's resemblance to a crucifix was no accident, and was an obvious sign that the killing was part of some sort of dark religious ceremony. While much of the cult speculation can likely be attributed to the ongoing hold that so-called satanic panic had on the public imagination back in 1994, it's worth mentioning that based on our research, there were at least three cults or cult-like organizations within driving distance of the Hawkesbury River at the time. It appears that all of them had been investigated by police for things such as violent rituals and crimes involving children. The specific groups that we came across included the Twelve Tribes Cult that had set up communities in the Blue Mountains, the Order of Sharble that was located a few hundred kilometers south in the city of Naura, and the Kenja Communications Cult, an organization that apparently still has centers in various Australian cities, including Sydney. Though we could probably make a whole video about each one of these groups and the things that they have been accused of over the years, as far as the murder of Rackman goes, this is where the connections seem to end, as despite widespread attention from the media, nothing ever emerged to substantiate the theory or connect the case to any religious group. This isn't to say that public speculation was entirely useless, however. Many of the names of missing people suggested to police were investigated, and a few of them even seemed to be promising leads. Perhaps the first contender to make this short list was a man named Christopher Dale Flannery, an alleged hitman widely known by his underworld nickname, Mr. Rentakill. Flannery was widely believed to have been responsible for as many as 12 murders during his criminal career, including the high-profile killings of a lawyer and a brothel owner, as well as the attempted murder of an undercover Sydney drug squad detective. Flannery disappeared in May of 1985, just a few months after surviving an attempt on his life as he and his wife approached the front door of their house. On the night of his disappearance, Flannery allegedly received a phone call from George Freeman, a Sydney crime boss who he had previously worked for as a bodyguard. At the time that Rackman was discovered, it was widely believed that Freeman had murdered Flannery either before or after their meeting on the night of his disappearance. His suspected killing seemed to fit the profile that police were looking for, a gangland-style killing where an elaborate mode of death wouldn't have been out of the question. After all, Flannery had made a lot of enemies over the course of his criminal career. Still, the case was more than nine years old, well outside of even the two-year timeline that experts had estimated Rackman had been submerged in the water. Eventually, Flannery was abandoned altogether as the potential identity of Rackman when dental records definitively ruled him out as a match. Another name that came up in the search was a Greek businessman named Peter Mitris. Mitris had last been seen in the Sydney suburb of King's Cross in April of 1991 and was thought to have been involved in the illegal drug trade. Though his disappearance was still slightly outside of the time window investigators were working with, it wasn't as much of a leap as with Flannery. On top of this, police had previously received information during their investigation of the case that Mitris had been beaten to death and that his body had been dumped in the ocean, somewhere off the Sydney coast. However, Mitris was a full 10 to 12 inches taller than Rackman, and his sister said that his crooked teeth did not resemble Rackman's. The third missing person police investigated was a man named Stephen Bryant. While it appears not much has been written about his case, 
what little we were able to find in our research, said that Bryant disappeared from the village of Tukabia, about a six and a half hour drive north of Sydney, near the end of 1993. Reports state that Bryant was last seen by a neighbor on December 23, 1993, when he accepted an invitation to come over for Christmas dinner, but subsequently did not show up. The neighbor reported him missing about a month and a half later, and when police searched Bryant's house, they found the place completely undisturbed. There was food in the cupboard, his clothes and possessions were untouched, and the power and telephone lines were still connected. The only suspicious thing was that Bryant hadn't touched his bank account since a week before the neighbor had last seen him alive. It's unclear why exactly police thought Bryant might have been Rackman, though some reports do mention that it was believed that he might have been involved in a drug rip-off scheme that could have been responsible for his death. However, it was the final two missing people that police considered at the time that showed the most promise in solving the mystery of Rackman's identity. The first of these two men was a convicted drug dealer named Joe Biviano. Biviano disappeared from the Sydney suburb of Dremoyne in December of 1993 and was 30 years old at the time he went missing. Aside from being the correct age and the general time and location where he went missing lining up with Rackman, Viviano also had dark hair, was of Mediterranean descent, and was between 5'4 and 5'5. Based on his prior drug convictions, it also seemed reasonable that he could have been the victim of a gangland-style killing. The final person police considered at the time was a man named Max Tanchevsky, a heavy gambler who had last been seen in January of 1993 by his live-in girlfriend in the Sydney suburb of Newtown. Tanchevsky's girlfriend told police that at the time he went missing, he had $1,800 in cash on him, but that this was not unusual since he was known to withdraw large sums of money from the bank for gambling purposes. The girlfriend said that she had avoided reporting Tanchevsky missing right away because it also wasn't out of character for him to travel to the Gold Coast on gambling binges, which normally lasted for a few days at a time. However, when he left for Newtown in January of 1993, he never returned. Like Biviano, Tanchevsky was roughly the same age and height as Rackman, and had disappeared from an area close enough to where he was found. He also had dark hair and was of Eastern European descent, the other major demographic that experts had said that Rackman could belong to. Despite these two particularly promising leads, police still couldn't find a concrete link that could definitively identify either missing man as Rackman. While it's unclear if a dental record comparison was done in Tanchevsky's case, sources we came across say that Biviano's dental records could not be found. Years began to pass, but the mystery of Rackman's identity remained, with police entertaining any new lead that they could get their hands on, to no avail. Without an identity, the murder investigation itself was stalled as there was effectively no way the case could be investigated past what detectives had already uncovered. In 2005, police used improved DNA technology to test a sample taken from one of Joe Biviano's relatives with the weak sample they had from Rackman. It turned out not to be a match. Despite the setback, detectives were confident that if a solution to the mystery were to be found, it would likely come in the form of continued improvements in DNA technology. This turned out to be exactly what happened, when in August of 2018, just after the 24th anniversary of the case, New South Wales police announced that Max Tanchevsky had officially been confirmed as the identity behind Rackman. While you might think that the resolving of a more than two-decade-old mystery would be big news, it seems that the announcement of Rackman's identity was met with relatively little fanfare from the Australian public. Though there are probably many reasons why this was the case, and of course, we don't actually know for sure, we wanted to discuss three possible reasons. The first, and by far the simplest, is that perhaps people simply didn't know or had since forgotten about the case. It's not hard to see why this could be true. After all, it had been 24 years since Rackman was found, and updates to the case prior to the 2018 announcement hadn't exactly been frequent. The second reason is that the announcement sort of came out of nowhere, and police offered almost no information about how the identification was actually made, beyond citing advancements in DNA technology. 
What's particularly puzzling about this is that we haven't been given any information that explains why this testing wasn't done back in 2005 when Biviano's DNA was ruled out. Could the testing not be done for a specific reason? Was it done but was inconclusive and was never reported? We just don't know. This actually leads into another question that we had about the case regarding Tanchevsky's clothing. Namely, that if he was one of the people who police thought could be Rackman back in 1994, wouldn't investigators have shown his clothing and other items to his girlfriend? If they did, why wasn't his girlfriend able to identify him? This brings us to the final reason that the announcement may not be receiving very much attention, and that's because it's still an ongoing investigation. Though we now know Rackman's identity, the case is only really half solved, as authorities are now left with the far more daunting task of actually figuring out who was responsible for his murder. Unfortunately, it seems that little progress has been made here since the 2018 announcement. As far as the police investigation goes, all we know is that the case has been officially handed over to the New South Wales Unsolved Homicide Unit for further investigation. Moving to our own speculation about the case, it's worth pointing out that though police were never able to prove that Max Tanchevsky had any connections to organized crime, his girlfriend told police back in 1994 that she believed that he did have debts from gambling. She didn't know how much these debts were for or to whom they were owed, but given that the guy was known to be a heavy gambler, it's not too far of a stretch to imagine a scenario in which he might have owed money to one or multiple people involved in organized crime. Perhaps these people killed him when he couldn't pay his debts. When we saw this theory come up numerous times in online discussions about the case, the most frequent pushback it got was from people who argued that the steel rack seemed to be a pretty elaborate way to settle a gambling debt, or else that mobsters will usually choose to seriously injure someone rather than kill them in these circumstances so that there's still a chance to recover their money. This is a valid point, though perhaps the explanation is somewhere in between. That whoever Tanchevsky was in debt to was simply trying to hurt him, and things somehow got out of hand. Sadly, we may never know the reason why Max Tanchevsky ended up as he did at the bottom of the Hawkesbury River. Given that it's now been nearly 30 years since his murder, the likelihood of the people responsible for the chilling crime being caught seems slim, barring some other major breakthrough in the case. That being said, it's not impossible. After all, given that he was identified after more than 24 years, it's clear that Max Tanchevsky has beaten the odds before. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.